Early Childhood Educator and National Project Manager for Kids Matter Early Childhood, an Early Childhood Mental Health Initiative. In this Talking About Practice series, we're looking at how educators plan for social and emotional learning. As educators, we know social and emotional wellbeing is fundamental to children's growth and development. When educators have an understanding of children's social and emotional development, they're able to scaffold experiences to assist children to become confident learners. From the moment children are born, they are developing and learning social and emotional skills through their social interactions and relationships with others. They progress from being highly dependent newborns to becoming independent preschoolers with increasingly sophisticated skills and capabilities. We know that children are born motivated and are wired to relate to other human beings. They actively interact with others to create experiences to develop the skills and rewarding relationships that are fundamental to their social and emotional well-being. Children's developing social and emotional skills in their early years forms the foundation which learning and development depends, including life skills such as thinking, planning and decision making, essential for lifelong learning. While social and emotional learning is incorporated across many areas and elements of the National Quality Standard, we have focused each part of this series on a particular quality area, element and outcome of the Early Years Learning Framework. We are not implying that these are the only areas where intentional social and emotional teaching and learning take place, but more to allow a focused professional conversation with educators on their everyday practice. Relationships with educators play a vital role in developing a child's sense of self. When children experience warm, trusting and predictable relationships, it builds their capacity to relate to others, their sense of empathy and respect for others and their ability to participate in their own learning. Warm, responsive and trusting relationships between children and educators will optimise children's development and learning, provide comfort and support to minimise feelings of stress as they learn to negotiate their world, provide first-hand experiences of social and emotional skills and help children maintain a sense of connection to their families. Today we're at Daliga Preschool and Children's Centre. We will be observing and talking with educators about the importance of relationships in social and emotional learning and the role relationships play in developing a sense of belonging that helps children make sense of and contribute to their world. Hi, I'm Lottie. I work at Delica Preschool. I've actually worked with the four to five year olds, the transition group to school. And I'm also a two day community worker, support worker through the families and services and partnerships through our community. Hi, I'm Janet Jensen. I'm the director of Delica Preschool. I'm also the director of Scribbly Gum Dallo, our long day care centre out itself. And I've been working here at Daliga for um, 15 years. Daliga is a 59 children place centre. Um, we have children from two to five years of age. Um, the, our two year olds are usually only um, children that are specific needs. We have about 10 to 12 children with additional needs. Uh, three of those are high needs children. Tell me about some of the social and emotional competencies that you see in children in your service that help them connect to other children and to adults. Well I find um, children that do obtain Delega Preschool, they come in, some of them can be relaxed and settled to start straight away. We have some that are on different levels of the spectrum where we have to take that time out to observe and watch them, especially the first timers here, so we can actually work on the interest and the social ability and the emotional ability. What do you actually do with some of those children who are a little bit shy, hesitant and anxious when they first arrive? What are some of the strategies that you... In the beginning, it's, it's usually encouraged the parents to stay in the room with the child and talk to the child and talk to the teacher, have that interaction so that the child can see that the parent thinks it's a safe place for them to be. Um, they're talking to the staff members quite freely. They're playing with the toys and everything else and it's a gradual pull away until the teachers take over. Yeah. Once again, it's letting the parents tell the children what their next step is, that mum's going to go to work or dad's got to go to work. We'll be here to get you this afternoon. So children are reinsured of the situation. We have little things where some children just attach to another staff member. That attachment of that staff member will stay with that child for a couple of weeks, and maybe even right through the whole year, but it's gradually that child does. It just really normally takes about two to three weeks for a child to really settle in, get to know, that, oh yeah, we do go home. We do go home. That's Tell me about that attachment to a staff member and why you encourage um, a staff member to stay with a child 
for that period of time, whether it be a few weeks or you said even up to a year? I think it just helps soothe that pathway too because um, it's just like anyone when you work when you first start a workplace as adults, if someone really connects to you, you're drawn to them. Mm. And yeah, it's and just so really a natural nice aura. It's for the staff yeah. and the and the child itself um, to have that um, attachment. So that child is seeing that um, educator as their secure base? Yes, oh, very much so. Yeah. And it could be like one of the girls in the office and they'll come in and they'll talk and they'll say, what are you doing? And the, the children are more or less allowed to go everywhere. As you said, that um, close attachment is working with those families and empowering the families. And that's what we really do in the centre is really empower our families because a lot of them have had hard times. A lot of them have been through a lot of... Um, issues that really affects their parenting skills. Those relationships that you have with families, how do they actually support children's social and emotional learning? Well the other day we had, um, we had a gardening day and we had parents come in and help with the gardening. They talked to the children about the gardening, the worms, why there was no worms in the garden, why the soil was good or why it wasn't good. And the children were talking and relating to their parents in a different way than what they would at home. Mm -hmm. um, they're seeing their parents in a different light. Um, and that's building up that relationship and it's also building up the children's social and emotional wellbeing because look my parents here at the school, we find children where the parents don't turn up get very distressed because their parent didn't turn up. So we then make a phone call and say oh please can you just spare 15 minutes and come quickly call in at the school. Mm -hmm. Most of them call up because yeah. we've rang them and they'll just come so that the child can see them at the school and building that relationship and letting the parents see how important that is to their child builds a stronger relationship between the parent and the child as well as between the parent, the child and the school. Our relationship with our parents is very strong. It's mm. something that we build on. It's, and I guess the, most, um, the best example we can give you is that one year we had uh, a terrible out in the community rift between two families and both families, clans, came to this school and we had the end of year Christmas concert and we didn't know what to do and we ended up um, singing John Lennon's um, peace song, War is Over, yeah, this, is this is Christmas, yeah. and the two family clans were on either side of the school yard and at the end of the song there was not a dry eye in the place, mm -hmm. you know, so that's how big that relationship can be in this service and how um, yeah, not only does it help the children but it can help the community to heal mm -hmm. um, and we really find that a focal point for our service. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the um, sculptures that you have around your playground. That was part of our healing program um, and it all sort of stemmed from not only the incident but a few other things that have happened in the centre. We just we sort of looked and there was a lot of help out there for the adults and for the grown-ups but there wasn't much help for our young ones. How can we help the kids make um, sense of all the trauma that's going around them in the community? and we developed a healing program and part of that was the clay therapy. Oh. It, it was a two-pronged approach. It was yeah. one for the children to be able to create something and talk about what their feelings were, but it was also so they could work together to build bigger things, bigger structures, and see beauty in that. And that was, it showed the parents that working together, our children are capable and very competent individuals and I think the parents were surprised. I, I know I was surprised with some of the sculptures that we had mm -hmm. um, and yeah, again it's built the, the confidence in the parents of oh, my child is smarter than what we think we, they are and also in the, you know, the community they're saying wow you mean four-year-olds did this? We're going yeah <laughs> they did. <laughs> you have a lot um, happening here with um, working with families um, so what sort of um, opportunities do you give your staff or how do your staff reflect and um, develop their knowledge around some of the things that you're actually doing? It's coming back to our collaboration meetings where we have our meetings fortnightly and we talk about the processes and the outcomes that are happening in the community. When we first started discovering that we're doing a lot more counselling than what we initially mm -hmm. um, needed to, um, we sent uh, three of us off to parenting courses. Um, Lottie's done Parenting Under Pressure, as well as myself, and I've done the Marta Mayo, which is reconnecting the child to the family. So we want to make sure that the advice we gave was a professional advice, mm -hmm. and not just um, what we thought. Janet, you were talking to me earlier about um, the importance of people feeling valued in their qualifications and certificates. Tell me a little bit about what you um, have done to promote the skills within your team? Well when I first um, 
became director, I asked the team what is it they want to be seen because I have a mainly Koori team. And um, they said, we want to be professionals. And I said, well, you are professionals. And they said, no, we want mainstream to see us as professionals. And I said, oh, so I said, well, just be seen as a professional. You need a certificate, really, sort of. And um, so Lottie already had a certificate, but we ended up, all our staff have been certified a long time before it became COAG target. Um, and they can be certified in um, their chosen field. So our bus drivers have transport and logistic certificates. Um, our uh, office girls all have their certificates in their um, various fields of what they do in the office. And in fact, one of our office girls now has just gone on to do her leadership course in a bachelor um, degree. So, you know, it's, it's built people up slowly to become what they can be. Um, one of our um, workers only went to year nine and when we got this, um, said, oh, well, you can work here, um, but you need to have a certificate. Um, he was a bit doubtful, but once he got his certificate, he said, it's the first time I got a certificate in anything. He said, I didn't think I could do it. So it's empowering the staff to know that they are um, professionals in their chosen field. And we found it had a, a roll-on effect in the community because our HSC students now are going on saying, saying, oh, we have to have a certificate to work there, so we have to finish our HSC. We have more children now completing their HSC um, than what we had when, we, when I first started. Partly, I feel, because of us, but you know, not only just what the education department has done, because the community people know they need a certificate to get Tell a job. Tell me about how important those relationships with children are to make the most of some of those um, spontaneous um, experiences that children have uh, during the day to turn them into intentional teaching moments. I think it's very important to have that relationship with the children to be able to build on their interests. Um, you, we first learn it from the parents what the children are interested in, so that's our first talking point with the children. You know, it might be their pet dog at home, it might be they're interested in trucks or it might be in football, and then we can bring it into the classroom and plan around that. Tell me about some of the things that you actually do with children to help them self-regulate, to help them actually talk about their feelings. Younger classrooms where they don't have the voices to talk about, it's, it's allowing them to express themselves and giving them the names of what their emotions are that they're expressing because mm -hmm. um, they don't understand what they're going through. So we name the emotion first and then we work with that to build them up to be able to um, express it more freely in words and art and craft. It's really for the children if you're visualising and working with them and really taking note and interest and building that relationship, it, it opens up. So you really see families and parents as um, partners? Yes, very much so because it's a journey. It's a journey because hey, they were first teachers, then they handed over to us to be that pathway of learning that transition to school process and they build those strengths in, in their children. Lottie and um, Janet, I'd really like to thank you for um, sharing some of your experiences here at um, Delicate today. I'm sure that um, the people who will be watching this video will be very interested in your thoughts and it's really good to see the National Quality Standard and the Early Years Learning Framework in action. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When children trust their environment, they are able to learn about themselves and how they relate to their world, feel safe to explore and develop self-confidence. As toddlers are developing their sense of self, they can struggle between their drive for independence and autonomy and needing to feel safe and secure. Older children become increasingly more independent, supported by their increased language, thinking, planning and organising capacities. Educators contribute to this development by planning an environment that allows children to feel safe and secure and encourages independent exploration. For toddlers, this may mean limiting the number of choices. For preschoolers, this would be giving them control over their environment and routines. Today we're at the kindergarten and we're going to be observing and talking with educators about how the physical environment supports social emotional learning how they plan for the environment to promote competence and independent exploration. We'll also be looking at how they plan and the physical environment actually supports and promotes empathy and respect among children. 
I'm Margaret Hammersley, the owner and the director, the nominated supervisor, educator and leader. The kindergarten was built in 2005, opened in January 2005. It is a 39 place centre with two playrooms and we enrol children from two to five. My name's Kylie Warwick and I'm the room leader in the kinder, in the kindy room um, with the two to three year olds. Margaret and Kylie, can you tell me a little bit about um, how does your environment um, promote um, social emotional learning and independence? Our environment is a very natural environment or as natural as we possibly can be within the constraints of the um, early childhood sector. We've worked very hard to maintain it in that sense and we've worked in the last eight years to build on that premise. We also have a philosophy that is uh, based on respect and competency of the children. Our image of the child is one that is rich and capable. So we believe that our environment enhances that belief for us. The open-ended nature of the environment, the ability for the children to make choices on what they would like to do and see on any one day and we encourage a collaborative relationship between them. We have lots of um, very small grouped activities or experiences um, because they like to work in, in small groups. In the, in the mornings and the afternoons, the, the children all come together as one, both rooms, so they're family grouped. Um, and so they use that time for the older children to um, to look after the, the younger children. For example, they might give them a push on the swing or help them um, do some cooking in the sand pit. It just um, provides a bit more independence. So your environment, I noticed this morning when we were filming, we had children inside and outside. Can you tell me a little bit about your philosophy around children's choices? Yep, we, um, we, we give them that, the freedom of choice because not, not all the children want to play inside or outside. And um, it lets them explore the different areas and, um, and some children learn better outside under the tree doing a painting than they would inside. We allow children to make the choice but there is a subtle intentionality about it all and if we see a particular interest arising we will subtly guide our children towards that interest or around that interest and build on, on that. Tell me about what some of the experience that you do that encourage children to understand their own feelings and develop empathy towards others. They love Home Corner because they're caring for the babies and quite often they'll take on the role of being mum or the baby themselves and they show that care and empathy towards each other in their role play. We have quite a number of pets in the centre and uh, we, we have two lizards that the children are very close to and unfortunately our bigger lizard is missing at the moment. Um, he has escaped from his cage so that was a very good experience for the children to empathise with how Lizzie might be feeling. Is she lost or is she cold? How is she eating? So all the questions and the theorising that came out from that, that um, episode happening. Tell me a little bit about um, how do all of the children um, relate to Lizzie or, Not all Lizzie the no. or the staff? No. <laughs> Kylie does not like lizards and will go next into the next room when she knows Lizzie's out of her cage. And the children respect that. They all comment on the fact that Kylie and Amanda don't like lizards and if that we have to tell them when we're taking our lizards out of their cages. So it's interesting because that again is showing the empathy the children have for, for that experience. You don't have a large um, outdoor area. No. So what are some of the other things that you've actually done to incorporate um, and use the space available? Our yard is sloping so it does present its own difficulties particularly when we have a lot of rain so and our grass wears very quickly and I'm determined to keep natural grass so at times we have to block it off. Um, early in the piece when we first opened we um, ventured out. We thought well we can't stay here because we've blocked off our area so we looked at and brainstormed for possibilities. We have an area across the road that is a park and we have taken that on as our second play space, we call it our wild space. And the children uh, just love going over there, we've done it as a routine excursion, we've risk assessed it and we have invisible fences 
um, but um, and we wait till the children are trustworthy, not only we trusting them, but us trusting them trusting us before we venture out. So in the last month is out, we've started a journey out to our wild space. The other thing we do is we do a lot of neighbourhood walks and these are opportunities for children to um, express feelings because we've found dead birds on our walk, we've found litter on our walk and the children voice their opinions and their theories when they see these things happening. We have an area and in our two recent floods our verandas have been absolutely um, indispensable in what we've been doing because everything was so wet and the rain so consistent that we've had we've had to remodel our whole day for extended periods for something like three weeks it was in February. Tell me some of the things that you actually did um, in reorganising and rethinking about your day. What, what was the planning that went behind that? Well we sat down and we talked to the children about the fact that our grass and our playground was very muddy and the sand pit was like quicksand. You stood in the sand and your feet went straight down because being on a slope, the water comes straight into the sand pit. So they're all things that we have to take into consideration when we have a lot of rain and we do on the mid-north coast. So um, we talked about it and we, we have a culture here where we read the cat in the hat. Whenever we have more than a week's rain, it's time to read the cat in the hat. And we talk about what would happen if the cat in the hat visited us and how we could um, overcome his mischievousness. It's amazing when you actually put the um, emphasis back onto the children and get them to be thinking. And how does the physical environment support some of those spontaneous moments um, that arise when, we're, when um, providing experiences for children that go somewhere completely different to where you um, might have thought they started and out at the beginning of the day? It's so open planned um, and there's nothing is set, it has to be in that place. So we can move things around the room and different places and get things out of the cupboard and, and add them in. And so you mentioned before that children actually know where things are. Yeah. So they yeah. contribute yeah. to that planning. Yeah. Yeah. On Monday, one of the children actually asked that we've got some toy dogs in the cupboard and they actually asked for the dogs to come out so we could build a kennel. We talked earlier, Margaret, about um, the group of children you're working with are uh, into um, building and making and producing things. So tell me a little bit about how the environment supports them to do that. I found that the group of children this year that have moved into the preschool room are constructors. They have to build. Everything that we put out, has, they have to look for this end point. And we haven't had a group of children like this before. We've had the odd one within a larger group, but the core group of children that we have across the week this year want to make things. And it's fascinated us, so I've created a construction diary and it's got all the different areas where anything can be constructed in our day. It can be from with clay through to blocks, through to collage, anything that, that you think can create something, that's what I've create, put in this diary. And it's amazing to see how the children are using the space and the collaboration and the expression of ideas and the shared knowledge as they sit and work with the materials that are on offer. And they will ask you for certain things if they want, if they've got an idea, for instance, the boat that's hanging from the ceiling took four weeks to make and we weren't allowed to take it apart. It had to stay there and it was taking up nearly half the room at the time, but- Had signs all over it, do not touch. <laughs> <laughs> but out of respect, because we're tr this part of these um, expression with the children and thinking with the children is to learn respect, and it's a very hard um, emotion and, a, and thought to get across to young children is to respect, particularly during our meeting times when we've got our agenda and, and they're talking to each other and over each other, and we talk about respect for listening to each other. Tell me about your meeting time and your agenda because I'm sure that there will be a few people immediately thought that was staff that you're actually talking about. <laughs> yes, um, 
I've waited till probably the last two weeks to actually bring the concept in. I could tell that the children were ready to move on to a more formal way of talking in our morning meeting. So, and we're ready to start talking about news and they've settled into the understanding how, how our day starts. And so we've used the word agenda and um, they've worked out that that's a list of what we need to do while we're sitting and talking. And we tick it off. And yesterday I was reminded as we moved on to our agenda that I'd forgotten to tick one off. And we've made a decision, a collaborative decision, that there'll be five items on our agenda. No more than five because they realise that they're missing out on playtime if we go too long. I've also noticed that um, outside and inside there's lots of spaces and um, confined areas for children. Tell me a little bit about um, why you felt that was important in setting up your environment. The children, like, well, they like to huddle together and hide under things and, and discover what's, what's down there. A special uh, place that they've found at the moment that they like to be in is in amongst our reels. There's a, a spot they can, they can sit in and they were down there this morning hunting for rabbits. Um, and one of the children actually came through underneath the reel and they weren't expecting that, so they actually caught a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> never a dull moment, is there? No, no, never a dull moment. And one of our favourite games is hide and seek. And because we have a landing and the children can get under the landing, which is fine because it's all you know sprayed for spiders and everything else. But it's just adults can't get under there but we can see them and we can reach and, and get them out if anything happens. But it's just enough space for them to sit in there and believe that they're completely concealed and hidden. Um, and that's, that's a very, very much a favourite spot. And why is that important for children to have that space? I think it's important that they own it. That's, my, that's some, something that I've got control over and that's my power. And I think that helps to build that self-esteem and that confidence and, um, okay, I'm in a big area, but this is my little area. They know it's theirs and that we can't come in. Tell me a little bit about um, none of this just happens. So tell me what actually do you do as educators? How do you find time um, for reflective practice? What sort of professional development do you um, have for your staff? Mm -hmm. Well, they're all really important ones. I'm an, a great advocate for ad adults as learners as well as children. And part of this philosophy that we adhere to here is very much on, it's a whole learning community. We're, le we're researchers with the children and um, it, it very much underpins what we're doing. So this year we've all got reflection diaries, personal reflection diaries that we write in each day. Um, we are uh, very much into professional development and I find um, I like to bring professional development into the centre rather than go out. Sometimes we do depending on what it is but being in rural Australia you normally have to travel quite a distance or stay overnight so it gets very costly so I found it um, a more cost effective way for us is to network with our immediate um, in, uh, early childhood services and find out which, which things are um, common between us and cost save that way. Thank you Margaret and Kylie for um, having us um, share your morning here. It's been um, really inspirational I think and I'm sure there'll be um, lots of interest when we um, use this. It's really good to see uh, the national quality standards and the early years learning framework in practice and um, hearing from educators. So thank you very much for having us. It's Thank a pleasure. You. Thank you very much. Children benefit from having plenty of opportunities to develop, learn and practice their social emotional skills in their everyday experiences with educators and peers. When educators purposely arrange experiences or respond to spontaneous opportunities with children, they support children to develop in and enhance their social emotional skills. A balance of holistic approaches to teaching, intentionally planned and child initiated experiences enhance children's social emotional learning. Today we're at University Preschool and Childcare Centre and we're observing and talking with educators about how they intentionally program 
for social emotional learning that develops a strong sense of well-being and enables children to make choices and decisions that influence events of their world. I'm Eileen Webster, I'm the Assistant Director of the University Preschool and Child Care and I'm also the Educational Leader at the Centre. I'm Lindley Rees, I'm the Director of University Preschool and Child Care. We're an 85 place centre, so quite large. We're divided into three sections, uh, nursery, toddlers and preschool, and we have two rooms in each of those sections, so there's six rooms all together. Um, because of the way we're set up, we're able to have quite small group sizes, which um, works really well for the children and for the staff. It means that we can develop some really good um, good relationships with, with the children, with our families. Tell me a little bit about how you plan and provide for children to make choices around the uh, things that they do on a daily basis. We use a play-based program and we have large blocks of time set aside for the children to be able to choose from the resources and equipment that are set out. So they, with having large blocks of time, they're able to choose the types of things that they're interested in um, and then spend time with that, um, extending their play, um, extending their thinking. The staff um, come in and support the learning, so that happens, uh, some of it's intentional, some of it's spontaneous and happens um, just as, as a situation arises. So Eileen, tell me about how that is for babies then. Well I think uh, the most important um, area for babies is, is the collaborative partnership we have with the family. We have a close working relationship with the parents to build up knowledge of each child um, so that we can tune into their needs to learn the little, the little cues to, um, to know more about the baby's needs, their little signs, their little signals that um, we can pick up on. So tell me um, how your educators actually tune into children. One of our um, strong areas is the orientation program for, for our new parents. Uh, we invite the parents to spend as much time in the centre prior to them returning to work. We then have that opportunity to observe the parents with their child. They observe the carers and the educators with the, with the babies and uh, we exchange knowledge of the child, of the program um, and then we, we begin to see, you know, sort of pick up the signs, you know, when, when baby's happy, baby's maybe a little bit uncomfortable, baby might need to be fed, might need to go to sleep. Our educators in the nursery are very experienced uh, to the point they can predict what is, what is next needed in the child's uh, daily routine, so the baby doesn't, he's not left to be distressed prior to sleep, the, the staff are very tuned in. So tell me about what some of the social and emotional skills are that children need to actually help them make decisions. They need to have a good sense of self, of who they are and where they fit in, in, in the big scheme of things. They need to feel connected with their, with their carers, with their with their family naturally, with the community that's around them, even with the children with a, that are within um, their little group. Tell me a little bit about um, the curriculum and how you actually intentionally plan to develop some of those social and emotional skills. Having good relationships um, with the children, really getting to know what their interests are um, and where they are developmentally. Our educators um, once they, they know the children well, they, they can um, work out what their interests are, they can follow through with interests, they can actually plan the environment around some of their interests. Um, and being a play-based program, it, it offers the, the, there are lots of uh, open-ended um, resources. During the routine of setting up for lunch today, we noticed that um, well, there were cards on the table in the where the children were to sit that had their 
photo and their name. Tell me a little bit about how educators actually intentionally um, use those cues for children and how they actually might contribute to their social emotional well-being. Everybody loves to see themselves and know where they belong so um, one thing having the picture with the name is the child can see where they're, where they're going to be sitting. They can also see who's going to be sitting next to them that day. Um, so it, it sort of gives them a, a, a good advance indicator of where their place is going to be during that period of time, which with young children can often be a very um, difficult time to manage because young children and are a bit resistant to changes in the routine and so it's giving them a bit of forewarning as to what's coming next. Um, they can also talk about where they're sitting, who's sitting next to them. Um, the staff are able to use that as a, um, a talking point as well so they can say yes and you're going to be sitting here and oh look you've got your best friend sitting next to you today. So it sort of does give a, a bit of a um, in introduction for the children and easing, easing into the next transition of the day. Also today we um, saw that there was a, a bobcat turned up outside the fence outside. So tell me a little bit about, and you uh, mentioned Lindley before about it's not all about intentional teaching and sometimes, well it is all about intentional teaching it but sometimes it's um, not what's planned, it's what actually happens on the day. So tell me a little bit about how you um, educators in your service actually make the most of some of those spontaneous events. Educators being very aware of what's going on and, and what the children look like they're interested in and yet yeah, spontaneous things come up all the time um, and yet yeah, we were lucky today with the, the bobcat um, although they've been working there for quite a while so the children have been interested in the whole process and the staff, have, um, the educators have been uh, going and, and we're taking children and, and enjoying that process. Today we saw children, lots of children being quite independent and having a very good sense of agency. Tell me what it is that um, educators have actually planned for to help children develop those social emotional skills to get to that point. The children need to have a, a very strong sense of themselves and where they fit into the environment um, and into their community. And the staff go about um, giving them that sense of self and, and confidence to, to explore through very forming very strong relationships with the children, spending time with them one-on-one, -on -one, talking to them, going through things so um, letting them know that they're valued, listening to them, um, responding to them with our very little ones, making sure that um, the children are aware of what, um, what, what's going on, so going running through routines with them when they're changing their nappy, letting them know what they're, they're actually doing um, and uh, if, if if a child is indicating they want a story or something but the, but the educator is busy with something else, letting them know that okay I'm just going to go and do this but I'm going to come back and I'll read the story with you. So all the time making the child feel like they are important, that they matter um, and that they, they have a, a real place within that community. So. Tell me a little bit about how staff are supported to extend their own knowledge um, and skills to actually ensure that children's social emotional learning remains a focus point of your programming. We were involved in the Kids Matter pilot um, and so that gave us a lot of access to resources and to actual um, facilitation in, in, um, in, in children's social and emotional development um, and their well-being. Also, we're very lucky that we have a management committee that, that um, um, makes good allowance in the budget for further development, staff development. So we send our, our, our educators out um, to professional development. And we also have lots of opportunities in the centre for talking um, in team meetings and general staff meetings where we can just sit down and talk together about uh, different situations that are arising in the, in the centre, maybe talking about 
particular children that we think might be having problems so we can sort of bounce ideas off each other as to how we can manage those children um, and how we can be focused on, on, on their social and emotional well-being. There's all, we also um, have lots of opportunities to talk with the parents as to what, how they, they feel um, their children are going and what their children's needs are so the staff can actually learn from, from the parents as well as to how, 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 what things the parents feel work well with their children. So there's a lot of collaboration going on right through the whole centre. Time is always a really important thing and something in early childhood education and care services we struggle to find enough of. Programming time is one of those things that is also um, something that's really important. How do you actually manage that in your service? What opportunity and how do you give um, your educators that chance to reflect and plan? Well, we are quite fortunate that um, the, the management allows us to have quite a uh, good lot of staff on, on board so that we've got staff over and above ratios that can um, relieve other staff while they do non-contact time. Our um, room leaders in particular get um, time every day to reflect and write up the journal um, and to uh, do write up some records and observations of the children. So that's about half an hour every day they get to do that. And in addition to that, they get a block of three hours every week to um, do a bit more in-depth reflection and um, recording of observations. During that time that they're out of the room, we have, um, we're able to employ a, a full-time staff member who actually steps in to relieve each one of those as they're out of the room. And that's a, um, a, a staff member that is permanently on board. She works full-time. Uh, so she's well known right around the centre, she knows all of the children and she's comfortable stepping into various roles. In addition to that we do do some out of hours um, team meetings just so that we can get all of the staff together to reflect and that usually happens about once every month or we'll have um, a we have uh, a general staff meeting and prior to the general staff meeting, um, each of the teams will break into smaller groups and have um, individual team meetings as well. And um, about once every couple of months, I'll actually meet with um, all of the room leaders so that we can bounce ideas off each other um, and try and improve our practice. And I also meet regularly with the assistants as well. And Eileen as our educational leader, um, does a lot of mentoring with the staff one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you Eileen and Lindley for, and the um, other educators at your centre for sharing your day with us. It's really encouraging to see the National Quality Standard and the Early Years Learning Framework in action and particularly seeing those social and emotional skills develop in the children. So thank you for sharing your day with me. Yeah, <laughs>